I got a surprise last week when I saw some news stories about the King's Birthday Honours. I'd forgotten that some states celebrate the King's Birthday in June and not October. I reckon for most of us, if we think about the King on the first Monday of October, we're actually doing pretty good. Uh, of course, last year with the coronation of King Charles, we probably thought about the crown a bit more than normal. But most of us barely give the king or the governor general much thought. Uh, The king's character, his activity doesn't make much difference to us. Uh, We're not too worried about the monarch, but many of us pay attention to those we elect. Uh, We've already had local council elections this year. There'll be a state election in October. Sorry to bring it up. Uh, This year, hundreds of millions of people will vote in national elections around the world. Uh, The results of the Indian election have just been declared. Uh, The UK government has called a snap election and you can't avoid knowing that Americans will be voting for a president later this year. When you think about voting, uh, about having a say in those who rule nations, what kind of things are important? What values and character traits are important? Today we're listening to Psalm 22, which paints a picture of the best king, the greatest ruler. One of the questions that might come to our mind is, what does this mean for the kind of person we should want as prime minister or local councillor? Though as we go through, I think we'll see this psalm is mainly about something a bit different. Now before we get into this psalm, I want to briefly help us think about how we read psalms. Uh, For many Christians and even non-Christians, the Psalms are a favourite part of the Bible. But I reckon we struggle to know what to do with many of the Psalms. It's hard work to know what they mean for us, how we are to apply or sing the Psalms. Uh, The Psalm we're looking at today is a prayer for a king or a description of the ideal or best king. For us... Are we meant to pray this for King Charles? Is that what it means? What if Australia becomes a republic? Do we rip this psalm out of our Bible because we no longer have a king to pray for? I want to give us a three-step process for reading psalms. I got this from a friend of mine. He was speaking at a camp Natalie and Jacob went to earlier this year and he taught it to them, so I'm stealing it straight from him. This is a way to do biblical theology as we read the Psalms. Biblical theology just means understanding the Bible on its own terms, Uh, understanding the big story, the big picture of the Bible, understanding it as being all about Jesus. So the three steps or the three questions we can use as we read the Psalms are, first, how did Israel sing the Psalm? Second, how does Jesus sing the psalm? And third, how do we sing the psalm in Christ? Now, they're the headings we've got, and we're going to work through them in a moment. Um, What we've got to see is you've got to do the first two steps before we can make the psalm our own. I think that's a mistake we often make with psalms. We, We take the psalm straight away and we use the words of the psalm as our words without first of all realizing, no, it's it's Israel's words first. Then it's Jesus' words, and it's only as we are in Christ that they, the, the words of Jesus can become the words that we sing as well. I'm not going to argue for this. I'm just going to do it. We're going to suck it and see. We're going to have a go at reading Psalm 72 using that kind of way of approaching the psalm to see how it helps us to appreciate and to, to take the words of this psalm and make them our words. So first... How did Israel sing the psalm? What does it mean when these words are on the lips of faithful Israelites? Well, this is where the heading of the psalm helps. The psalms are different from any other part of the Bible. Uh, They're different because the headings are part of the Bible. So many Bibles have section headings, like in the Gospels you might be reading along and then there'll be something in bold print that'll say, Jesus calms the storm. Now, In every other book of the Bible, that heading in bold print is not part of the Bible. It's been added by the editors to help us find our way around, but it's not part of the Bible. 
And that's why when we train people to read the Bible out loud at church, we tell them don't read the headings because they're not part of the Bible, but the Psalms are different. So you look at Psalm 72 and you've got in, in the church Bibles here, the black Bibles, it's in italics, it says of Solomon. Now that, those words of Solomon are actually part of the Bible. They, they're part of the ancient Hebrew text of the Bible and of Solomon, it either means this Psalm was written about Solomon or it was written by Solomon. I think most likely Solomon, Israel's third king, the great son of King David. I I reckon it means that Solomon wrote this psalm. Maybe he wrote this psalm to be sung at his coronation. And so we start, as we pick up Psalm 72, we start imagining it. How would this song sound when it was sung during the reign of King Solomon? The heading tells us that's the setting, that's the context it was originally put in. Psalm 72 is both a prayer for Solomon and for all the kings that come after him. And it's a picture of the best king, the ideal king of God's people. Uh, the psalm asks God to do five things for his king. Uh, the first thing that the psalm prays for is the character of the king. It asks God that the king would be righteous. So have a look at verse 1, Psalm 72, verse 1. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. And may he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. Uh, When we hear the word righteous in the Bible, most most of us think being right with God or having a right relationship with God. That's not what righteousness means here. In verses 1 and 2, it's about judging rightly. And that's what we want from a king, that he punishes the guilty and lets the innocent go free. Righteousness. Last week, Mitch talked about building projects. If you're building a house and the construction company rips you off, you want justice. You want the court to judge with righteousness to force the company to give you a refund for work not done. We don't want a corrupt king or judge who takes bribes from wealthy people. That's what we often think of when we hear the word justice. And in the Bible, righteousness and justice are are pretty much the same thing. And in the Bible, righteousness and justice also has another angle. So often it's about being right with God. Here it's about righteous or just judging But also, look at verse 4, biblical righteousness, biblical justice, doesn't only mean punishing the guilty. Biblical justice also means protecting those in need and crushing those who oppress. Doing good to the poor, caring for those in need, in biblical language, that's justice. If you ignore the poor and don't help them, according to God's word, you're not just being unkind, it's not right. It's not just. So that's the first thing about God's best king. He is righteous and brings justice. And that's the prayer of this psalm, that the king would be like that. Uh, The second part of the prayer is that this king's reign will never end. Verse 5, May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mowing field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. Now, we might know eventually stars uh, die, they burn out, but compared to a human life, they may as well be everlasting. That's the prayer for this king, reigning forever. Uh, The third part of the psalm is a similar thought. Not only does the psalm ask God to make his king rule forever, but also for his kingdom to cover the whole world. Verse 8, may he rule from sea to sea and from the rock to the, sorry, from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all the nations serve him. 
uh, the picture of the, the river to the ends of the earth, it picks up language we read in Genesis 15. God promises to Abraham, to your descendants I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. But this psalm explodes that expectation from the river to the ends of the earth, not just river to river, but river to the ends of the earth. And it talks about Tarshish, Sheba and Seba. We don't exactly know where these places were, but it was the the ends, the extremes of the known world. Now, for most kings, I don't think we want to pray this part of the psalm. We don't want most kings to reign forever over the whole world because giving that kind of power to a sinful human is, is a disaster. But remember this psalm, begins by asking God to make him righteous. And a righteous king ruling everywhere forever, that doesn't sound so bad. And it doesn't sound that bad because fourthly, the king of this psalm has compassion on those in need. Verse 12, for he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence for precious is their blood in his sight. Now, this goes back to what we heard at the start, showing pity on the weak and needy isn't merely nice. It's right and just. It's what the poor and needy rightly deserve because their life, their blood is precious. And when someone like this is king, someone who is righteous and just, rescuing the poor and needy and destroying those who oppress, well, that's God's blessing, isn't it? God's blessing comes. Verse 15, long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May grain abound throughout the land. On the tops of the hills may it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvellous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Imagine this psalm being sung as as Solomon is crowned. The people praying that God would give him righteousness and justice, compassion on those in need, that God would bless his kingdom, that they'd overflow with food and precious metals, and then praying that God would give his righteous king rule over the whole world forever, blessing coming to the whole world forever. That's how Israel sings this psalm. And from our time in 1 Kings, God pretty much answered this prayer during the time of Solomon. He was a great king because of his wisdom. And we talked about his wisdom. He was wise in all kinds of ways, but particularly wise in judgment. He made good decisions, cutting through the lies that people tell, so that the guilty got punished and the innocent got rewarded. And God gave him a kingdom, not to the ends of the earth, but he ruled over that whole region promised to Abraham. And during his reign, the nation was blessed. In fact, you know, this is all summed up in two verses in 1 Kings chapter 4. It's up on the screen. Describing Solomon's reign, the people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were happy. And Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms, from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subjects all his life. During Solomon's reign, the the prayer of Psalm 72 is pretty much fulfilled. But it wasn't completely true. Solomon is ambiguous. He builds a, a great temple for the name of the Lord, but he did it by enslaving people and forcing them into, into hard labor. And then after Solomon, everything goes downhill. His son never reigns over all Israel. But the nation is split in two. Instead of one righteous king ruling over the whole world, that's what the prayer is, it's two kings ruling over scraps of land. 
after Solomon, you wouldn't say God's people are blessed. Once again, during his son's reign, so during Solomon's son's reign, Rehoboam, the king of Egypt comes and strips the temple of its treasures. At the end of 1 Kings, we heard about life during the reign of King Ahab. There was no blessing. Instead, deep drought and biting famine. And Ahab is totally corrupt. Instead of justice, he arrests and kills every true prophet he gets his hands on anyway, just because they speak God's word. And eventually, we read about this in 2 Kings, eventually the kingdoms crash. First, the northern kingdom is wiped off the map by the Assyrian Empire, and then the southern kingdom is conquered and taken into Babylon as exiles. Psalm 72, you sing it during the time of Solomon with joy, but after the time of Solomon, for hundreds and hundreds of years, it would have been very hard for Israel to sing this psalm. Faithful Israelites would start to sing Psalm 72. They'd get up to it and then they go, Endow the king with justice. And it would get caught in their throat. Why won't God answer this prayer? Why won't he, he give us a righteous and just and compassionate king? And so for hundreds of years, they sing this psalm and they pray this psalm with tears. But it doesn't fall on deaf ears. Uh, God answers the prayer of Psalm 72 in a surprising way. He answers the prayer of Psalm 72 in a better way than I reckon any faithful Israelite had imagined. So we're up to how Jesus sings this psalm. Now you might be thinking that this idea of Jesus singing this psalm is a bit weird. I mean, he literally probably did because he learnt the Bible, but Jesus doesn't sing this psalm by praying to his father that someone else would become the great king. No, Jesus sings this psalm by living it out, by being the answer to his people's prayer. Jesus is the fulfillment of Psalm 72. It's not really about Solomon. It's about Jesus. Uh, King Jesus is righteous and compassionate. In his life, we, we don't see him though, do we? We don't see him pronouncing judgment from a throne. But we do hear him calling out the the righteous hypocrites, sorry, the religious hypocrites. He condemns how the, the Pharisees and scribes use religion to oppress the poor and needy. We see him acting justly as he chases the money changers out of the temple, cleansing God's temple, getting rid of corruption and greed. We see him welcome and care for the little and the least. He sees the godliness of the, the poor widow as she, she gives her copper coins. He welcomes the little children. He sees those in need and he heals them. King Jesus brings God's blessing, but not in the way we might expect. We, we hear it at the start of, of the Sermon on the Mount. In Jesus' kingdom, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who hunger for righteousness, those who are persecuted, the meek, they are called blessed. That is the life of flourishing in Jesus' kingdom. So we see some of the fulfillment of Psalm 72 in Jesus' life, but Jesus fulfills Psalm 72 even more clearly in his death, resurrection and ascension. On the cross, Jesus is the righteous and just king, a king executing judgment. It's not necessarily the way I think about what Jesus did on the cross. I don't think about Jesus being a king executing judgment, but on the cross, Jesus is both taking the punishment sins deserve and he's also standing in judgment over sin. By taking the punishment sin deserves, we see Jesus doesn't turn a blind eye to sin. He doesn't excuse it or shove it under the carpet, but Jesus faces full on what sin is really like. And on the cross, he stands in judgment over sin. As Romans 8.3 says, God, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and this is the important bit, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. Condemned. That's the language of righteous judgment. 
In his death, Jesus rightly declares the sinfulness of sin. And he condemns, he punishes sin by taking his people's sin into himself, onto himself. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. The cross is where we see the righteousness and justice of King Jesus. And on the cross, Jesus is compassionate to us in our need. On the cross, he rescues us from our oppressors, not human enemies, but sin and death. By condemning sin and dying the death we deserve to die, King Jesus pours out mercy by compassionately forgiving his people. He rescues everyone who turns and trusts in him, everyone who pledges allegiance to King Jesus. And in his resurrection and ascension, Jesus is king of all people for all time. He is king for all time because he has defeated death. The tomb is empty. Death cannot stop King Jesus. And because he's ascended, Jesus has poured out his spirit. The spirit is given to people from every nation, every ethnicity. Jesus isn't just king of the Jews. He's not just king for Australians. Jesus is king of the whole world. And so people all over the world praise Jesus because his reign will never end. Philippians 2 has this amazing picture. Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because Jesus willingly humbled himself to the cross, he is now risen and exalted, the king of everyone from everywhere. So every knee should bow and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and King. That's how Jesus sings this psalm. So how do we sing this psalm? How do we make it our prayer? Should we think about King Charles or the Prime Minister when we pray Psalm 72? Yes and no, but mainly no. This is why biblical theology is important. We no longer live in ancient Israel. No longer is the king of any nation also the ruler of God's people. The job of being the Christ, the king of God's people, that's Jesus' job. No one else gets that job. Christians have made terrible mistakes when when we misapply the teaching of the Old Testament to kings and presidents. We can't just lift Psalm 72 and straight directly pray it for our government. But... Read in the light of 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy 2, which tells us to pray for kings and rulers. There are some things from Psalm 72 we can pray for our government. We can pray for good, righteous and just government. We pray the government will show true justice, including compassion for those in need. 1 Timothy 2 teaches us to pray for kings that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We pray for order and justice in our society so we, believers, can live faithfully for Jesus as good citizens. And verse 4 says, our prayer for kings and governors is about salvation. We pray that those in power might be saved by Jesus and whether they're believers or not, that they would be conditions in the places they rule, conditions where the gospel can be heard. Now, of course, God is powerful. He saves people when the government persecutes Christians. But we pray, our prayer is, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, we pray that we might live quiet and godly lives so that all people might hear the gospel of Jesus and be saved by him. But 1 Timothy 2 gives no reason to pray that our government might rule the whole world or last forever. Only Jesus, because he is perfectly righteous and just. Only Jesus can be that king. So in a small way, like the really minor note that this psalm uh, sounds for us is praying Psalm 72 for our leaders. 
But most of all, we sing Psalm 72 as we trust in Jesus. We sing about this ideal king in Psalm 72 and go, that's Jesus. And then we submit to him as king, like the kings of Sheba and Seba, bringing gold to him. We give everything to Jesus in worship and honour of him. Take our life and let it be consecrated to Christ. And, and as we sing Psalm 72 about Jesus, we turn what in Psalm 72 are requests. It's asking that the king might be like this. We turn those requests into praise. We don't have to ask God to make Jesus righteous. We don't have to ask God to make Jesus show compassion. Jesus is already like that. So those things that are requests in this psalm, on our lips, they become words of praise because Jesus is like this. And so, for example, we pray, verse 17, may his name endure forever, may it continue as long as the sun. Now that's going to happen anyway because that's God's plan. But that's also our heart's desire, so we pray that God will do it. Then all nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. That's our prayer, that people who don't currently call Jesus blessed, who don't see that he is God's forever king, our prayer is that God will mercifully open their hearts, that they will join us in praising our best king the Lord Jesus. So let's do that now. Let's pray that God would do that. Almighty God, we praise you for Jesus. We praise you that Jesus, your son, our king, is full of righteousness and justice. We praise you because his reign is over all the earth and he will reign forever because he's defeated death. We praise you for Jesus' compassion because that's our only hope for salvation. And we praise you for the blessing of knowing Jesus, of sin forgiven, eternal life assured, that we might know you. Please grow our love for Jesus, our amazement at Jesus. And we pray for your mercy on kings and those in authority, as well as our friends and family. We pray for the nations, that you'd pour out the blessing of salvation in Christ on them. Amen.